OK, good afternoon. I hope you can all hear me. So welcome to today's session. My name is Sam Mahotra and I'm a senior lecturer at the Professional Law Institute, which is part of the Dixon Poon School of Law here at King's College London. And it's a real pleasure to welcome you and in many cases welcome you back to today's event. So once again, great to have many people with us. That's fantastic to see and it means that no doubt we will have lots of interesting questions for our expert panel. So just briefly before I introduce and hand over to our panel, I'd like to share a few introductory thoughts. So as Chris mentioned in the last Essential Skills for Future Lawyers talk, this discussion about skills is coming at a really critical moment. We're in the middle of turbulent and unsettling times, not just because of COVID. As we heard last time, technology shifting, organisational ways of working and of course socio-political change are all affecting numbers of industries, including law. But I think it's fair to say that COVID has accelerated change in a way that we've never seen before. Against that background of uncertainty, I've no doubt that working out what this means for your future career will have been playing on many of your minds. So this is a really useful time to be thinking about what are the key skills that are required and will be required of those looking to enter the legal profession. That's always been an important part, you know, part of the puzzle, as we know, but perhaps takes on an extra level of importance in these times. Here at King's in our LLB and our LLM programmes, we work hard to equip our law students with many key business skills in addition to their academic learning. So not only do students develop key skills on the academic programmes, but we also offer our law students courses in, for example, strategic decision making and negotiation. Plus, all our students have an opportunity to develop their presentation and advocacy skills through mooting and their client relationship skills and practical experience through working with clients via the legal clinic. And with the help of the employability team and innovation such as the legal clinic and indeed the professional law institute, King's is very much about demonstrating a commitment to our students that we understand what is required of them when they enter the profession and we'll do our best to help them stand out at that point. Now, as part of that offering, the Professional Law Institute has been delighted to host this year's The Future of Legal Practice series. And if you've been following us, you'll know that just this year we've explored a wide range of topics from gender equality in the legal profession to the rise of technology within law, the impact of COVID on the, the legal profession, and of course, the original talk in this mini series on essential skills for future lawyers. And if you were able to join us for that last talk, you'll know that there were a ton of great questions that our terrific speakers, Nigel and Roger, just couldn't get to in the time permitted. So today's event is a one off special follow up Q&A to that session where our expert panel will just be answering your questions around the skills, competencies and behaviours that legal employers and just as importantly, their clients are and will be looking for in the new generation of lawyers. I'm delighted to say that both Nigel and Roger are here with us again today and also that we've been joined by two more great voices of experience and expertise, Mira Ferguson and Catherine Rusin. I'm going to introduce them all fully in a second, but I just wanted to finish off, if I may, with a couple of housekeeping points. So first of all, you'll see on, I believe, the right hand side of your screen, a Q&A function for your questions. We're going to start with some of the questions that came up in the original talk that we didn't get to, but we really want to make sure we answer as many of your questions today as we can, and that this session is as practical and as helpful for you as it possibly can be. So please, any questions at all that you want to ask of the panel, just pop them into that um, Q&A box as we go along. And Chris Howard, the Director of Professional Legal Education and the host last time, will be helping me keep track of all your questions and we'll try and put as many of these to our panellists as is possible in the time we have. Standard caveat, um, you know, I have to please do bear in mind that we may not get to every question and also that if there are a number of questions on one point, we're likely to consolidate those uh, into a single question. The only other thing just to mention is that this session is being recorded and we'll make that recording available on the Professional Law Institute's website as soon as possible after today. And in fact, when you head over to that page, you'll find recordings of all the previous talks in the Future of Legal Practice series. OK, so without further delay, let me introduce our panellists and then we'll get this discussion underway. So as I said, delighted to have Nigel Spencer and Roger Parker back with us again. So Nigel is a hugely respected voice in learning, development and talent management. <clears throat> He's a senior client director in the executive education team and an executive coach at the Saad Business School in Oxford. He's also a visiting professor at the School of Law, Queen Mary University, London, having first obtained his BA and his PhD from none other than King's College London. 
Nigel specialises in leadership development within the professional service sector. Now that includes thinking about future legal career paths, embedding executive coaching in organisations and the development of degree programmes. He combines a rich academic and research background with key industry experience, having held the position of Global Director of Learning and Development at two international law firms, Reed Smith and Simmons and Simmons. Uh, he's behind many firsts actually, but he also led the creation of the first innovation hub in a global law firm whilst at Reed Smith. So welcome back, Nigel. Also rejoining us is Roger Parker. Roger is senior counsel with Reed Smith and an independent consultant. Again, Roger combines skills training with experience. So he is an Institute of Leadership and Management Level 5 accredited coach and mentor. He's also an accredited mediator at the Centre of Dispute Resolution in London and has more than 25 years practice experience. Indeed, he's listed as one of the UK's leading litigators in the Euromoney Guide to the World's Leading Litigation Lawyers. He's also been a member of the firm's senior management team for many years and has held many management roles, including managing partner for Asia Pacific, managing partner for Europe, the Middle East and Asia, managing partner for Europe and the Middle East, and originally managing partner of Richard Butler. So welcome back, Roger. Great to have you with us again. And for those of you that heard the previous talk, you already know that Nigel and Roger are fantastic speakers and very good at giving clear, straight talking answers. And that also goes for our two additional panelists who also bring even more experience and expertise with them. So in, um, first of all, Mira Ferguson. So Mira is Deputy General Counsel at the ADECO Group, the world's second largest human resources provider and temporary staffing firm. She's a city trained lawyer with over 20 years of in-house experience and as ADECO's Deputy General Counsel, she has management and operational delivery of the UK's legal function across this multi-branded organisation. She has a people first approach to training legal professionals and equipping them with the right skills to work in house and to be key business partners. She also has considerable experience of working with many law firms and knows what skills are particularly important from the client perspective. And from my talk to Mira, I know that not only is she really invested in developing young lawyers, but she's also passionate about something that's very close to my heart, and that is the human relationship that is at the centre of every good lawyer client interactions. So welcome Mira. And the last member of our panel is Catherine Rusin. Catherine is Global Director of Learning and Development at White and Case, where she is responsible for leadership and management training and coaching worldwide. She has 20 years of experience in global leadership roles in talent management and learning and development in the legal sector, having worked for a number of great international law firms. She's worked extensively in Europe, Middle East, Asia Pacific and the Americas, so truly a global outlook. And her particular interests and area of expertise include leadership development for senior teams, developing young lawyers for the global legal practice of the future and digital learning. Catherine's also seen the profession from a practice perspective because after studying for a BA and an MA in modern languages at Oxford University, she qualified as a solicitor practicing in mergers and acquisitions at two international law firms before moving into talent management and L&D. She's also an advisory board member and former co-chair of the IBA's Academic and Professional Development Committee. So welcome, Catherine, and I hope you agree that's a pretty fantastic panel. So with instructions underway, I want to get, get straight into um, some questions. As I said, I'm going to start with a question from the last panel. And I think this question really goes almost to the heart of what today's session is about. And actually, I think I'm already seeing this in the questions that are coming in from the audience. So hopefully we're getting straight into it. So I'm going to ask each member of the panel this question. And the question is this. So if you were advising students applying for training contracts and pupillage now, what would you say was the key skill for lawyers today? So uh, it's going to be hard, but like, what is the key skill that comes to mind? And le maybe let's kick this, this discussion off with Nigel. Well, thank you very much, Simon. It's great to be here um, again. So um, thank you. Um, I think on this one, in terms of which which key skill I would pick out, just thinking about it, as you said, Sam, from a firm's point of view. So if you were applying and you're, and you're, you're applying to a, to a firm either for a vacation scheme or for a placement or for, or for a full time role, I think I would pick out adaptability. And I suppose I would say that, wouldn't I, given the current situation that we're living through at the moment? But, you know, some things have struck me, Sam, over the last few weeks. For example, how firms have now moved sometimes in terms of how they do their objectives for the, the people in their teams. They've moved to rolling 100 day objectives almost. So this idea that 
in the current situation we're going through, we all need to be really, really flexible. And OK, so I think we need to lay aside, at least for the moment, that debate, perhaps for the future more generally, that thought of actually I'm going to roll. It's going to be this. It's going to be very defined. I think it's going to be much more different than that. It's going to be very open ended. So being more flexible, being, being more flexible in terms of where you look for opportunities, how you the types of firm you might want to go into, but adaptability, adaptability, I think um, Sam will be front and centre. Fantastic. Thanks, Nigel. I think you're exactly right. Um, can we go next to Catherine? What would you say was the key skill for lawyers today? Thank you, Sam. Um, I would echo uh, everything that uh, that Nigel said, um, and I am in a very large global law firm right now, so uh, I can testify to the importance of that flexibility and adaptability. I think one of the things that's really shone through for me, um, it's always been at the heart of um, my approach to learning and development and um, most of the programmes that uh, I run internally at my firm, but it's really about teamwork and collaboration. Um, in a, a major global law firm, you cannot get very far unless you can build effective relationships with your teammates and uh, with other teams across your firm. And nobody can do this on their own. Nobody can develop major client relationships on their own or bring in new business, and nobody can actually deliver the standard of service that our clients expect. Therefore, um, I would really emphasize um, the development of, of those skills and a real focus on those skills from the very, very beginning of your legal career. And it sounds very simple, doesn't it? Teamwork and collaboration, but uh, there are many subtleties to that, which I hope we'll get the chance to uh, explore a little bit later. Fantastic. Thank you, Catherine. Yeah, absolutely. And having been in practice myself, I, I completely agree. It, it is largely about knowing what your strengths are and then collaborating with with people in your in your group to present a complete package. Um, Roger, can we go to you next? Thanks, Sam, and uh, thank you very much for having me today. Uh, my answer would be listening and communication and thinking about communication in the widest possible sense. Um, by listening, I mean really hearing, um, not just hearing the words, but trying to translate it that into an understanding of what the speaker is really endeavouring to say. So whether that's uh, in the context of a, a quasi-social discussion uh, in the work environment or whether it's in relation to a work project, uh, to really make sure there's an understanding of what the other person, in many cases one's boss, uh, is really trying to achieve. Uh, and of course that rolls into the question of what the client really does want to receive from its professional services advisors. So think about communication in a very, very wide sense. And of course, the other part of this is keep those you're working with fully advised as appropriate about the progress of your project. Uh, and, and how many times do we hear from clients that the, the providers are not as robust in that area and as proactive as we want to see? So at the beginning of the journey, thinking about listening, thinking about communication. Brilliant. OK, so so far we've got some great key skills and attributes coming out. So adaptability, flexibility, collaboration, teamwork, listening and communication. Mira, anything further to add um, from your perspective of both an in-house lawyer and also the client? Thanks, Sam, and, and again, thanks for having me and hello to everybody out there and um, keep all those questions coming. I'm excited to see what comes out of the next hour or so. Um, I absolutely echo um, what the panel has said in terms of the skills. I think, <coughs> excuse me, in terms of being in-house, I knew this question was coming up and um, so went out to the business and again and again, what they said to me was being commercial. What they care about being in-house is about the commerciality. And it touches all around the point that, you know, you've got to be adaptable, you've got to be flexible, curious, self-motivated, especially in this current climate. You know, we're in lockdown. It, it's a real challenge to kind of get out there and feel motivated, you know, we're all in the, maybe in a little bit of the doldrums. We're not sure what's going to happen in our career. But fundamentally, my business over and over again say commerciality. And that's the essential skill if you want to be in-house. It's the ability to provide appropriate and legally tight advice but also so that it avoids kind of overkill and legal jargon. And that's a real hard skill to muster, but it's one that, that makes you the best in-house lawyer. It's getting under the skin of your business, understanding what drives it and, and working shoulder to shoulder with them. 
So you can absolutely understand and influence them and make the right decision in an in-house function. Brilliant, thank you. And actually, I think that, you know, a lot of that would also go for, for the lawyers in private practice as well. Understanding your, your client's business immediately improves communication and um, uh, you know the level of advice that you offer. Roger, do you, do you, would you agree and add to that? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think, um, I mean, having, having the rounded ability uh, in these areas um, undoubtedly is absolutely key, uh, Sam. So, so I, I, I totally agree with that, that, that general sentiment. Perfect, thank you. Okay, uh, Sam, and I'm can I just, um, sorry to jump in for a moment, but uh, there's a question that links to this discussion, which is Sana's come in and said, if you're a training contract applicant, uh, what's the best way at that stage to demonstrate commercial awareness? So building on that commercial awareness question, how can you demonstrate it at an early stage? And thoughts on that? So I think, hi, it's Mira here. So I think, you know, it, it's tough at that stage because obviously you may not have been exposed to, you know, a private practice, a you know, worked in private practice or in-house. But I think being curious, I think being open-minded and asking lots and lots of questions, that, that for me is, is key in terms of, you know, getting, you know, you, you want to get um, the right kind of lawyer and the trainee in. And I think the one that kind of will then become more commercial is, is going to be the ones who ask all those questions. And it doesn't matter how many questions you ask, it's, it's never enough and it's never wrong. And I think often what we find is those people who are scared to ask the questions will struggle initially. You know, you're just at the start of your career. You're not expected to be the perfect, most amazing lawyer. But if you don't ask the questions, then you'll, you'll fall short very quickly. I think um, just being open, um, listening, being curious, those type of qualities in terms of um, what, you know, what we're kind of looking for often really helps. Brilliant, thank you, Mira. And I think- Sam, just to, to, add, just to add to that, I think uh, um, in, in terms of focusing as well on the question of goal, and plan and objective. So really with those questions and with that listening, understanding what the person asking you to do something is, whatever nature, what are they really trying to achieve? It doesn't always have to be a legal project. Uh, it can be something where you're organising an event. What's, what's the real purpose? What would be a successful outcome? What does good look like? So it's really thinking about the end result sometimes and working back. But obviously if one thinks about the end result and works back, having not really listen to the information that has come from the question, as has just been said by Mira, uh, then one could be going down the wrong path. So it really is, I think, uh, concentrating a little. Exactly, because I guess success in a project or a task means different things to different people. So you want to make sure you hit what success means for, for whoever it is you're doing the work. So Sam, um, Mira's, Mira and Roger's point, they just made me think as well. Someone, I remember one partner once saying to me, they said, we need a, a young folk coming into the firm to think, you know, clients don't have, don't look at their world and think, oh, I've got a legal problem. Well, not always. They'll think I've got a business problem. You know, it's actually about as Mira, as you were saying, it's about the context of your advice and all the advice that your, that your team helps the business with, really. Completely. I mean, I think, you know, I mean, from, from my experience um, in practice as well, one of the things I would always say to um, trainees and juniors that I was working with was that the client wants an answer. That it, it, they don't, they, you know, the law is almost a given. They want an answer to their issue and, and we're there to help them get there. Um, I just want to pull up on a couple of other questions that have come in um, relating to sort of different stages in a person's legal career journey. So, we, I mean, that's a fantastic answer and a really succinct set of skills for somebody who is seeking a training contract at the moment. But I just want to do quite a quick fire supplementary question round to see how your answers change if somebody is at a different stage of their careers. So uh, Mirid, maybe could you, could you, would you answer the question, would your answer change for someone who is about to start a law degree? So they're, they're at a bit of an earlier stage in their, in their career journey. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, I think the key thing is not to panic. Let, let's not panic in the current time in terms of where we are. It's OK if things don't almost go your way. And, you know, to, to, it, it, that's OK. Don't panic. Take it in your stride. 
And I think at that stage, it's really important to hone the soft skills and build the network of relationships if you're able to. It's valuable, you know, from my perspective, say yes to everything. If there's an opportunity out there, say yes to it. Even if it's working at the cheese counter at Tesco's, all those soft skills that you have, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that, with, with building your network. It doesn't have to be legal. It can be, you know, different people from different backgrounds, from different professions. All of this is wealth and it's information and it's education and it's learning and all these skills and all these experiences you have right at the start of your law career are really going to turn you into um, the most fantastic rounded lawyer. They're going to, you know, all non-related um, kind of experience will still shape you, will still give you a set of soft skills that will allow you to triage matters, communicate better, listen, because you know, I know lawyers are not great listeners, me, me, you know, me included, but you know, it'll allow us, you know, it gives you a sense of, you know, patience and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And, you know, over the course of your, you know, your degree and your, your RPC slash SQE, you'll then find, you know, where your strengths are and you'll be able to play, play to those. And, you know, you, you, you know, you're then able to, to kind of differentiate yourself in the marketplace, I guess. You know, not everyone is destined to be a black letter lawyer and that's OK. There's nothing wrong with that. But but don't, you know, my, my key advice would be don't say no to anything. Don't say no to the experiences. I mean, when I was training in the city, um, nobody wanted to do the, the secondment, the competition secondment in Brussels. There are only a few of us. And I'm like, well, I put my hand up and said, yes, let's go. And the relationships and the experience I got out there, I will always value and that can never be taken away from me. And that, you know, that supports your growth and your development. So say yes to everything, build your network and, and just try and focus on yourself and your soft skills. And also identifying the skills that you are getting through your experience is quite a key thing. So you don't, you know, you don't, you don't sometimes appreciate all the skills you're picking up in each individual piece of experience. So. It's worthwhile noting those down and I just want to take the next question which is what qualities take a junior lawyer so not to two year PQE to a more seasoned sophisticated lawyer so what happens when you're actually in practice and you're working your way through um, from junior to, to, to mid to senior uh, Roger and Catherine would you like to come in on this question sure Roger do you want to kick off and uh, and I'll follow Yes, so I, I, the first thing that strikes me in relation to that question is what a good approach to thinking about one's own movement through professional services. And slightly tying in with uh, what Mira was just saying as well is not expecting too much of oneself at the beginning. So the question of balance, uh, which goes to this sort of myriad around the word flexible that was discussed earlier on. And so thinking about one's competencies, skills, habits, qualities in a rounded sense, and maybe sort of dividing those up uh, and starting to see, well, this is where I am with uh, facet A, facet B, facet C. These are my strengths, these are my development points and just trying to practice and move on to the next level. But uh, picking up um, a, a, cu a couple of thoughts, the first is actually going to tie back to what uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, which was just thinking a little bit more about the goal and the strategy. Because uh, by the time one gets to a senior level, by the time one perhaps is uh, moving towards specialism um, and one's targeting board level discussions and advice, uh, the ability to think through the ranks, as it were, for want of a better phrase, but to think about junior, mid, senior, practice one's skills around what the strategy actually is. And that to me involves proactivity, a much overused word perhaps, but thinking positively about how I develop my knowledge of what the person asking me to do something is really trying to achieve. Um, by the time one gets to uh, let's say a partner level or some or director level or something of that sort. Um, one's really sort of setting the tone perhaps uh, for some of the discussions and advice and that has to be based on one's experience and intuition which are linked together um, but has been based on proactive thinking. So that would be one for me um, but don't rush that, don't rush that when one starts ask the questions, listen, watch and observe, think about role models 
but but don't rush this too much. It, it, it's experience. I would um, I would absolutely agree with that, and I and and pick up on Mira's point about being curious and uh, raising your hand for assignments. In that um, you may you may think you have it all mapped out, but um, the the pace at which the world is changing, as we've seen uh, very much demonstrated this year, means that perhaps the practice that you had set your heart on is not in the same position that it was six months ago, and. Um, you, you do have to be um, flexible, as we've said quite a few times, but also open to the opportunities and the connections that that helps you build with other practices. I had set out thinking I'm going to be a corporate lawyer um, and um, and that just seemed to be the right sort of fit and profile for me. But like Mira, um, I was asked to go to Brussels to do um, a competition secondment and it turned out to be one of the best decisions I ever made in terms of the network that I built um, off the back of that and the relationships that I then developed with the partners and the lawyers um, in the Brussels office of the firm I worked for subsequently served me very well in the eventual corporate um, uh, practice that, um, that I chose. As lawyers, we live a very regulated life. There's a lot of mandatory training and we, we also have to move through our seats as, uh, as trainees. We may circulate also into different teams uh, when we do pupillage, but always keep an open mind and embrace the opportunities. And, um, and I would, sometimes seek out the assignments that perhaps you wouldn't automatically volunteer for because they can be hugely beneficial. One of the best things I did also quite early in my career was be a buddy or a mentor for brand new uh, trainees or VAC schemers coming in to, uh, to my firms because uh, again I learned so much by looking at the world through their eyes and um, they could benefit from my experience and avoid the bear traps as it were and um, be more efficient but um, but also I got some new insights by talking to them and uh, hearing their experiences and the types of questions that they answered so I think it really is being being open and um, the what I say to all folks at my firm um, whether they're new or whether they are experienced laterals coming in is really take control of your career to, to the extent that you can so there'll be a certain amount that we serve up to you. We offer you nice training programs, secondments and everything you could wish for in, in some respects. But you've really got to have um, a clear idea of what you want to focus on. Be prepared for it to change if the market moves. But it really, really raise your hand for, for those opportunities. And, and sometimes it might be something that is alongside your core practice, which actually introduces you to a whole new network and perhaps raises your profile um, in your firm which will increase your chances also upon qualification and later in your career of, of getting those great assignments. Fantastic. And actually, I think you are already answering, but I'll a uh, couple of the, these the, um, questions, but, they're, but I'll ask them anyway to see if there's mm. anything more to say. So mm -hmm. uh, somebody has asked the question, what if a student has completed a master's focusing on one area of law, but has then realised that they're not interested in pursuing this in practice? Mm. Would mm -hmm. that applicant be seen negatively by the firm? No, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, as, as I uh, said earlier, you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, with lawyers at all levels um, with training programs and what those qualifications show is your ability to adapt and your ability to apply your mind to a specialist field. Um, those, those of us, in fact, all of us, I think, are on this panel remember the global financial crisis and um, how agile we needed to be in adapting to that. So in the firm I was working for at the time, a lot of our transactional lawyers had to retrain as restructuring and insolvency lawyers, and uh, they had never really um, looked at that field in any depth before. But because they had the right mindset, the skills and the will to do it, they were able to adapt quite rapidly to the new demands and the, and the support that our clients needed. So I, I don't really see that doing a master's in a topic is a bar to that then to moving on to something else. It, it's certainly not uncommon, I think, for um, people to change direction once they get a little deeper into the firm because perhaps they meet um, a particularly great team that they want to work with or there's a particular client or um, industry group that they want to support and um, people move quite a lot particularly at the junior to mid-level of their careers before they become deep specialists and, and start looking towards partnership. Yeah brilliant uh, thank you. So, so Sam just one point I'd, I'd, it made me think of Catherine when you when you were talking. Mm. But the one thing I, I really like Sam actually is sometimes when you're having a conversation with someone and they said oh well I did that program but you know what as you say I don't want to go in that direction now actually I like listening to people I like having conversations with people 
who show they've learned something from doing things. It's a mm. bit like that thing, as you said, about the placement in Brussels or whatever it is. Yes. You know, I think it's exactly the same, you know, or, you know, the number of trainees I spoke to, and Catherine, I'm sure, you know, and all of us on who probably, who said, oh, I've got to do tax next time. And first of all, someone's, the trainee says, oh, I'm not looking forward. Four months later, they say, God, I love tax, you know, or something. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, they actually learn. So actually being open to, you know, experiencing, as you say, whether it's Brussels, whether it's a different practice group you were expecting or clients common, whatever it is. But, you know, that goes to that qualification point, Sam. I think they may have tried a master's and thought, actually, perhaps that's not for me. That's great. So actually, I've identified something actually I don't want to do. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And, and actually, a related question um, So that Victoria is asking is, what areas of law will become more and more important in the future? And I'm wondering if, the, if there is a straightforward answer to that or if it doesn't matter so much if you've got that flexibility and adaptability. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you'd asked that question about six months ago, I probably would have confidently rattled off my top three. Um, but um, I think uh, I mean, the, the change I've seen, um, if I look at my area of practice over the years, is a much deeper focus on regulatory, um, huge emphasis on data and data protection, data management and data protection, which was not such a big thing uh, when, uh, when I was in, in practice, but it's a huge thing now. And um, definitely, as I have experienced over the last few months, um, being able to flip quite quickly to uh, restructuring and insolvency. Um, one group that never seems to be quiet in any of the firms I've worked for, and I should uh, confess at this point that I have worked for five firms, either in a uh, either in practice or in um, in a talent and learning role, um, has always been litigation in all its forms: litigation, arbitration, mediation. Um, that has. Roger can speak to that, but um, I, I have always known those groups to be pretty busy, whatever the weather in the uh, in the market generally. I suppose I'd add to that absolutely. I mean, I think we we can think about particular um, subject matters, particular topics, um, and at different points in economic cycles, yes, there'll be more demand. Um, my my sense around this is though to to think a little bit about uh, in the career context context, the overall direction of the career, as, as was one of the panel members was saying, to think to think proactively about one's career and building a platform uh, mm -hmm. from which your skills fit um, the direction of travel. And and to some extent for me, that means that there is an ability to, to adjust direction into different topics. Now, I do recognise, having said that, that you know, the client feedback and insights that I've been involved with for organisations certainly um, ranks highly the ability to uh, serve, you know, expertise, etc. Uh, so I'm not for a moment sort of dis disputing any of that, but the ability to move between areas. Uh, and if one took, for example, Catherine litigation disputes, mm -hmm. I mean, as, as you know, as we all know on the panel, it's a very, very broad church uh, mm -hmm. in terms of sort of you know, international arbitration or regulatory disputes. Or, so one might be thinking, are my skills fitted and suited to rights-based issues, for example? Um, I tended to think from a personal point of view about that and think about sort of following clients' instructions, but solution-based activities to achieve commercial outcomes. Um, to be honest, I would say my skills were not in terms of pure drafting, um, all lawyers have to be able to draft, I guess, <laughs> but um, think about one's skills and how they fit and then how that might apply to the subject. But there is also perhaps a little danger too early in life saying, I'm just going to be a lawyer specialising in subject X because there's a lifetime out there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think just to add to, to that point is, even as you get on in your career, you should always be looking at your skills and always reminding yourself of areas, for example. I mean, you know, I did it in lockdown because I was like, well, I have a little, a little bit of time that didn't last for long, but I did a, a kind of career map or an experience map in terms of all the different roles that I do in my role as Executive General Counsel at the ADECO Group. And I was like, well, I really should really focus on some public speaking, for example. Maybe I need to get back involved in the litigation team or employment. And you should always be moving forward. You should always try and be self-motivated and curious because those are, you know, those are the lawyers and those are the people that are going to be, you know, not only you'll satisfy yourself in terms of your career development, 
but you you know you want to be refreshing yourself and redeveloping yourself all the time don't just do it at the start of your career you're going to have to do this regularly whether you choose to carry on in the profession of law or whether you choose to do something else because you know we're, we're assuming that we're all you know a great group of you know um, really motivated ambitious young young students out there and that's that's what we want we want to be able to to, to, to be motivated in the careers that we have thank you and actually this is a perfect time for us to just sort of round off that career journey because there's a great question from somebody who was asking what is the position for somebody applying for a training contract but who is over 40. So what about that person who it has been in one career and has gained loads of really useful skills from that career and, and, and is looking for a change in career into law? Um, Nigel, what, what advice would you give them in terms of skills? OK, so, so I suppose my thought here, Sam, would be, and I'll tell a personal story in a, in a moment, is actually how can you package and position all those skills as you say that you've gained from from the breadth of experience you've had and think about how does that fit with the world you know with what i'm applying or i might be applying to say it's the world of law the legal sector so uh my first seven or eight years of my career were in humanities i stayed in research stayed at king's did my doctorate spent two years of that in in athens running an international research project etc etc so i was doing things what was i doing i i always thought about it later as as if I was running my own small business, you know, you had to get money for it. In other words, grants, you had to get money for it, manage a team, you had to negotiate with people, you had to build networks, you had to work internationally, you had to manage deadlines. Da, 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 da. And as I'm, and I was just, as I was saying those things, you know, because where I got to the place at the end of those seven years where I thought it's really, well, two things. First of all, it was really hard to get a permanent job in academia and for various other reasons, you know, time of life, I was thinking, what what should I do? So I literally walked into the career centre, but the way I tried to describe it was saying, well, these this is what I've done for the last seven years. But I described it in that way. And I, I guess I, I was working, I was sharing the direction of the project with someone who'd been in business and retired. So I don't know if that's what influenced me over a number of years to think of it in those terms. But, you know, and I remember when they, um, when I described what I've just, just said to me, they said, oh, have you thought of tax consultancy? At which point I said, OK, so what's tax consultancy then? Um, so, you know, but it just took me off in a direction and, you know, uh, EY offered me a job, PW offered me a job. So I went there in my late 20s, in effect, in a graduate job. So I was doing something where I was applying like the question that's come in at a much more senior age. But what I tried to do, looking back, I didn't think about it so clearly then, no doubt. I was I, the way I described it was in this skills. I looked at the competences they were looking for and then I tried to match what I'd done with what I felt they were looking for, Sam. So, you know, I just tried to ex to explain my experiences in, in their terms, in a way. Fantastic. Thank you, Nigel. And I just want to now um, really sort of hone in on some of these words that we've been using, some of these concepts, because um, I appreciate, you know, we talk about them all the time, but actually it's quite hard to work out sometimes what they mean and how do you demonstrate them? So a question that's come up from a couple of people has been around commercial awareness so there's two different questions actually um so one of them is i'm just going to try and scroll through and try and find it again yeah so there's there's a really interesting question about what are your views on what commercial awareness means for in-house lawyers compared to solicitors and i'm just going to add to that a secondary question which is a more general question which how do you authentically and that's a great word how do you authentically talk about your enthusiasm for the business world and show your commercial awareness without being integrated in a large business? So, um, Mira, would you like to start off that, that, that answer? Sure. So, um, commercial awareness in-house compared to private practice. So, I think um, I kind of touched on this at the start. For me, commercial awareness, and I've been with um, my company for 14 and a half, yeah, nearly 15 years, 14 and a half years now. Um, it's about, and when I joined, trust me, I probably had zero commercial experience because I was like, well, I really don't want to do recruitment and I'm really not a big fan of employment law, but I love contracts. And so let's see if something comes out of that. Um, and initially I kind of railed against, you know, we didn't really have process in place. Um, it was the MD that shouted the loudest that would that, that would get the answer. Um, but what I realised fairly soon was being a business partner, being a trusted legal advisor, understanding where their priorities lay, and actually making time to see my business, to spend time with them, to build a relationship 
was what it was all about. Being an in-house lawyer is not just about reading clause 12 of a contract around indemnities and liabilities, because that's not what they're interested in. What they're interested in is what does that mean in practice? And the best lawyers, especially the best contract lawyers, are able to translate 250, 300 page contract and the schedules and the exit provisions and whatever else you've got in there and distill it down in a way that the CEO understands and that explains risk and mitigation and how much money we're going to make or what we're going to lose and actually how can we get out of the contract and, and, to, and, and to, be you know, to, to be able to use language that is human language, that we use language you know, on a day to day basis because what you're doing, you're dealing with people who are not lawyers. You're dealing with people who have not read shitty on contracts or know about tort or anything like that. You're just dealing with the person off the street. Yes, they know business, but you know, getting to know the business is the most important thing. And I still do it now. This is quite this is probably quite sad. And I'm going to share it. It's okay. At the start of every year, I have my notebook and I write down all the you know, my CEO and all the MDs, and I take notes during the course of the year of how many times have I engaged with them? How many times have I had a conversation with them? It doesn't have to be work related. It can be, can we go for a coffee or can we go for a virtual coffee? It's those relationships that are really fundamental to being a great in-house lawyer and making sure that they understand and that you understand when you're reviewing a contract, whether it's for one placement at a, you know, at a, at a local you know, restaurant, whatever, or whether you're placing a thousand contracts as a, as a huge bank, you have to understand where the business is coming from. And for me, that's that's the strength of being an in-house um, commercial lawyer. And it's all about it's all about relationship, and it's all it's all about translating legal speak into practical, real advice that they can use. Fantastic. And Roger, would you maybe like to speak to what commercial look awareness looks like from within private practice? And how do young lawyers demonstrate that authentically? I would merge the two together. I wouldn't see them as a separate. Um, so uh, I, I, I would come at this personally from a knowledge perspective. So acquiring knowledge of the client's business, um, using the techniques we touched on earlier, um, applying knowledge. So the, the, the lawyer, the accountant, the surveyor learns what they learn, will continue to learn throughout their career. But for me, it's the application of the knowledge in a differentiated and practical, solution oriented commercial way that makes the difference. The great lawyers I can think of, they've got that ability to apply it and they've got a mindset, almost a role reversal which is they'll sit in the seat of the person giving them the instructions and they'll be able to read it. And the number of times I'm thinking of particular people who will say, yeah, but that, that's not what they want to achieve. This is what they want to achieve. Or that's the interpretation. Well, one has to ask the questions, of course, but the experience hopefully would build that up. Um, and then there's just a little example I'd give from uh, a conversation with a general counsel who, who basically use words along the lines of, I want my external advisors, not really to be external, but to be an extension of me, to be an extension of my legal group and my lawyers and to make my, the life easier uh, for my team. So um, the reason I say the, this should be merged together, Sam, is because ultimately the, the great commercially aware sort of become amalgamated with <laughs> as an extension of. So that would be my answer. Brilliant, thank you. And um, Nigel or Catherine, would either of you two like to add to that answer? Uh, Catherine, do you want to? Oh, you're on mute. I just uh, tapped. I just tapped the mouse by accident. Um, I would um, probably link back to the comment that Mira made um, very early on about curiosity. And um, one thing that clients love is talking to you about their business and that really helps you get under the skin of to Roger's point what um, their objectives are and what drives their decisions and the factors that they look at rather than the factors that you're looking at, at uh, as their legal advisor and I think as a young lawyer some of the best time I spent 
was actually going to client premises back in the, the days when you could do that um, and just talking to um, the client team that was going to be working on the deal with you. I distinctly remember one of my early due diligence outings um, back in the days before virtual data rooms where um, I spent several days camped out at a client's office and uh, I had to learn how to put fiber optic cables under the ocean because those were the contracts that my team was reviewing. Um, but it really made um, my team's performance and my individual performance in service of that client way better because I had taken the time to really listen to the client, understand what their objective was, what the risk factors were from their perspective, what the um, commercial factors were impacting their decision. And um, I could therefore give them you know, much, much better advice because I had understood what they were trying to do. A couple of weeks prior to that, I wouldn't have had a clue because um, fiber optic cables were not my area of expertise. But and, and it's a, an exaggerated example, but you, you get the general picture. I, I think just spending that extra time to um, to do the research and even as basic as making sure you read the press that your clients read. Um, and knowing what's top of mind um, for them so that when you have a conversation with them, be it an informal coffee and catch up or a more formal meeting, you can show that you're interested and that you've been keeping up to date with um, with issues that affect them. And that for me is really demonstrating your commerciality, but not in a salesy way, just in an interested tell me more kind of way, which will only help you um, serve them better. And, and, and Sam, just to add to that, because Catherine, on your example, that's you being at the client, you say sitting sitting at the client quite often for days. I was I remember Sam being struck once when um, I, I was um, I was in the firm and, and, and a, a, a partner had, had said to me, they said, oh, yeah, they said, you know, it's interesting what clients perceive as being really valuable because what, what had happened was one of the juniors had been out for a few weeks, I think, doing a due diligence exercise at the client. Um, and the one thing that had stayed with the with the client actually, because one day they'd come, they'd gone around to the room where the the the, um, the trainee was uh, out and uh, out at the client, and um, you know the client said to the the trainee said, "Oh, how's it going?" And the and the trainee said, "Oh, it's going fine, I think." Um, but can you tell me why do you as a business do this like this? You know, and they pointed to a document that they say, and that's the thing the client remembers. So all that thing about being curious, asking questions, but actually being embedded in the client's world and actually. You know, they so the, the trainee was actually the value or the interesting point I think there is the trainee was asking the question from a commercial point of view. OK, well, the, you know, I'm looking through these documents, but that's made me think, why does the business decide to do something like they decide to do it? And so being curious and almost not being afraid to ask the question, I think, as Mira said earlier as well. You know, so I think all of that is um, the being embedded in the client. You know, all of you will know I'm a massive fan of. Um, you know, clinical sort of experience and programs where we can get people out of clients for a few weeks and things like that. And and I think that's almost your point, Catherine, as well. You know, how can you get that experience being very embedded and very close to the client's world? Fantastic. And I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I just want to sort of develop that a little bit. So obviously we, you know, a number of our audience won't be in an organisation at the moment. They, they aren't at the stage of interacting with clients. So are there any practical tips we can give them in terms of um, how they can build up commercial awareness in this space. I mean, there's a great question um, um, from, from one of our audience saying that they have been using lockdown to attend webinars and, and virtual vacation schemes and then asking how do you go about in, in, in discussing these types of things in your application or on your CV? So how do you, if you do the right things, how do you then show that you're doing the right things? Well, Sam, I'll just I'll, I'll just make one observation. It's very it, it, I, I do regard it as um, fairly basic, but reading um, the business, reading about business, reading the business pages, um, reading the business pages on the web, and attending the seminars and events that that you mentioned. I mean, I think these are really really important because in the day-to-day -day interaction with the client, if one's able, one has to be able and ready, I think, to have a discussion about a commercial backdrop, a commercial landscape, uh, which may not necessarily be just, a, just about the problem at hand. It may not even be just about the industry at hand. Um, but uh, it, it's also important in the sort of netherworld of um, discussion between social and business, which can't be um, un underestimated because um, how often does one hear from the clients that I love working with so-and-so 
I love working with X or I love working with Y. That isn't, that, that goes back to Mira's point about relationships. That, 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 it, it's almost a given the person has the qualities of the professional that are required. Yeah. So at a very young stage in career, I think starting to build a knowledge base around uh, such matters, whatever your chosen topics or, or, or interpretations of relevant material. So there's no one topic, it's not just about business, but it may be about a certain aspect of that. I would say that's important. And when one comes on to the question of how one develops that and thinks about it, try and find uh, a peer network I actually think this ties in with um, uh, what Kathy was saying a little bit earlier um, when, when Kathy mentioned mentoring. It uh, can be a little bit of danger as one's moving along a career path just to think up, upwards and how do I get to the next level? Well, I'm sure that's important and ambition and progression is very important. But nevertheless, thinking about relations with peers on a knowledge base as well as a social base and also thinking about commanding respect from those below and building respect and caring about other people is fundamental. And you can help other people um, through these techniques and through the accumulation of knowledge and sharing. So just a few thoughts just to broaden the discussion a bit beyond just what do I need to move on to the next stage. Fantastic. Can, can I just jump in, uh, Sam, very quickly? Yeah. So this is Chris Howard. Um, I think that that Point actually goes to one of the earlier questions about mental health a really interesting question about if you're trying to be ambitious and you're trying to grasp all opportunities how do you balance that with maintaining your mental health and I think one way you can do that is using mentors and uh, you know really drawing on others to support you through your journey so I think that was a really good point Roger um, and I just also wanted to highlight there's a couple of questions around litigation um, and the extent to which some of the skills we've talked about could apply to litigation practice also in terms of developing online litigation, which is obviously going to be a, a big development uh, already is it a big development in the future. So and also a question about barristers and uh, advice for barristers. So how does any of this advice around uh, commerciality and networks and so on relate to developing a litigation practice? Is that for me, Chris, or is that, is that thrown, thrown, thrown that, open? Well, that was just generally for the, for the whole panel, really, whoever wants to jump in. Maybe Catherine was talking a bit about litigation. <laughs> um, not not my uh, not my specialist subject, but um, I was just talking about it in the context of it. You know, it, it um, does tend to be a practice that uh, remains um, busy and applicable across a wide range of fields, um, whatever's uh, going on um, in the uh, in the wider market. But I think everything that we've been saying about showing interest in the client's business and objectives, and you know, to Roger's earlier point about the listening and questioning is equally valid because um, you're, as a barrister, you're still serving a client. And when you're going to go, uh, when you're going to take a case, you have to really have an insight into what the client wants. And sometimes, as, as Roger also said, you've got to advise them on strategy and sometimes help them get a clearer picture of what they want. It depends on um, how uh, well versed your, your litigant is, but, um, your advisory skills, your communication, your questioning and listening become even more important because you've got to listen for the subtext of what people um, are saying and um, and help them um, make a decision that's going to be the right decision for them um, and their company or or other uh, or other organisation. And that for me is a great manifestation of, of commerciality because one of your major considerations um, in litigation is, do I pursue this case or not? What are my prospects um, of, mm. uh, of winning the case? And what might be the fallout, um, whether I, I win or lose? So you've got to weigh up all of those strategic factors in your decision. And um, that your, your job as a lawyer is to help guide the client through those decisions whilst you're not making the decision for them. Um, you need to help them articulate what it is they, they really want. and um, what's the result they want to achieve and, and what are the consequences of, of taking that action? And Roger, I'll, I'll be quiet now. Well, you, you know, I would just add to that, Kathy, that, that yeah, absolutely, I think, you, you, if I may, you, you, you answer that like a, a true litigator. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, linking it to the well-being point that uh, was, was also in that question, uh, was I, I would take this back to, I think it was Nigel who was talking about adaptability. Um, I, who, or apologies to whoever, adaptability because 
different different situations, different clients, different instructions. Sometimes one is searching for a salute, commercial solution around settlement. Sometimes one is not. One's running a point of law or something of that sort. But um, adaptability and, and and think about the word resilience uh, because adaptability, resilience, balance, and being able to leave some questions unanswered so that one knows that one can't go home every night with all the answers um, and understanding one's own ability to say, well, these are unanswered questions which I'll carry on working on with the team. This is the goal and the objective, etc. cetera. Um, but without that sort of concept of management of issue, let's call it project management of oneself and of the project, there is a real danger of constant thought. And we've also heard recently, haven't we, about how difficult it is to stop working in the COVID environment where people are working at home. Well, that, that goes directly to well-being and mental health in my view, because I think, Chris, it's really important to be able to say unanswered questions, let's deal with those on Monday. Do, do, do you know what, just, just, one, just one thought, Chris, and Roger, Catherine, um, mm-hmm. as well, is that you know, it took me to the. We were talking earlier, Sam, about when people progress and you know how they develop and the different skills they progress. Something, Roger, and going back to well-being, I think the thing of letting go becomes really important, which touches on the teamwork point. It touches on the collaboration point. It touches on. It's almost that point because Sam, I was thinking earlier when we were discussing. It's almost realizing you've moved it. You know, I always, I always thought when I was a fianna for seven years, you you almost start off in a team and you're the junior most member of say there's a partner a senior manager or you know a senior consultant and a, myself as junior and then i always thought as you gradually go through the years almost no one ever consciously or very rarely they consciously tap you on the shoulder and say oh don't forget nigel there's people behind you now you can de- delegate some of that stuff to so it's almost having the awareness that i have developed i need to let go of some of that stuff now because chris to your point you know the well-being point and roger as you say you it's almost that point of how can the team how can we all act as a team and help each other on this i think and the other thing i was just gonna say quickly about litigation it always struck me roger and, and Catherine and chris was that thought of um you're dealing with people often at a time probably in great stress i've always thought so almost that emotional being able to connect and actually notice how you know how the client's feeling and how feelings are you know are presenting themselves as well as just facts so there's thinking and feeling we often talk about from a development point of view that ability to notice emotion must be really quite quite important i've always i've always thought with litigation and actually i just want to pull some of this together because we're hearing some great terms and terms that are, are regularly used and i just want to kind of you know make sure we're all clear about that so we've heard about project management and and, and the relation that has to teamwork we've talked about resilience and then maybe as a separate connect to the point, we've got this idea almost of emotional intelligence. So, I mean, obviously these three things all interact and do help with that balance um, between sort of, you know, pursuing your ambition, but also maintaining good mental health. Um, but maybe one of the panel can just say, you know, why, why are these things so important in law? And how do you, again, how do you go about building development of these things? How do you evidence it, I guess? I think um, it's about sustaining high performance um, in yourself and um, in the team around you. Um, It's interesting that the conversation has really changed around resilience and mental health in in the last few months for for obvious reasons. But um, even before that, um, I think my firm and many others were really looking at that issue very closely. And um, one of the things you can't say to a team of lawyers is work less. Um, it doesn't really compute, um, but you can work smarter. And um, and I think um, for me, the first um, step in that is is self-awareness. So you know when is your best time of day, you know when you're productive and when you're less productive, and um, you also get to know that about your team. What kind of task are they best suited to? When is a good time of day or when is a good day of the week to, to work with a particular person? So I think um, really tuning into um, how you operate, how you think and how you respond. And also um, the same for your team members is really critical and really developing um, your ability to focus. Um, we all think we're great multitaskers, but um, you, you've probably heard that um, multitasking is a is a myth um, and you can try some fun exercises which will demonstrate to you that, uh, that you do not multitask very well, even if you think you do. Um, really looking at how you can sustain your own uh, productivity 
And I think the importance of renewal as well, um, making sure that you allow yourself some renewal time. Everybody's working a, a little bit off their normal schedules right now, so um, they have to be a bit more flexible. And you might find that, you know, you work late at night when someone else in your house is asleep. And that's fine if that works for you, but it's a, it's a choice that you make. I think the most important thing, going back to the point on um, emotional intelligence, is having a conversation about it. And I do feel that whatever trouble it may have caused, the current crisis has perhaps just opened up that conversation for, for all of us and made us more willing to open up and share the challenges that we're having. And also to ask the question, how are you doing without being afraid of the answer? Um, back in the day, you were probably a little bit worried that someone would tell you they were having a terrible time or they were really depressed and you didn't really want to know that. But um, now I think people are genuinely asking, how are you doing? How can I help? Um, what's going on for you during lockdown or, or whatever it might be? And, um, and we've, we've just changed that conversation and changed the vocabulary around it. And it all goes back to awareness of yourself and awareness of others. And not making too many assumptions and thinking about how your question or how your messages might land with um, different people in your team, your fellow students or your fellow trainees or uh, or whoever they may be. But it's um, it's really uh, I, I think that's one simple way just by asking intelligent questions and talking with your team about how you can work smarter is a good way to evidence that and you'll find um, as you start to work in your firm, some of you may already be doing virtual vacation schemes, etc. that you will hear those conversations more and more. Brilliant. And there's just a couple more terms that have come up within the questions today. So we're being asked, um, how do you develop your critical thinking skills? And also, how would you describe creativity in terms of problem solving? And I think they're great because You've got critical thinking skills, which has always been a traditional in the traditional skill set of a lawyer. But then there's also this other end of the spectrum, which is creativity, which is something that people are talking about more in terms of problem problem solving. So th does anyone want to want to jump into uh, those? Uh, I, think I suppose for creativity, just a quick thought is around, I suppose if you're the senior person, how do you create the atmosphere in your team where it's OK to do something and for it not to go 100 percent OK? And, and, and the risk is, of course, you know, professionals, lawyers, perfectionists, therefore want everything to go OK. You know, it's, it was, it's always been interesting to me when we had entrepreneurs come inside the firm, into the firm and sometimes they would give talks to, to the lawyers and they would say, yeah, I tried five things last year, four things worked and, you know, one thing went horribly wrong. And, um, and I was just wondering, you know, how how easy it would be to get them. You know, so that mindset of actually trying, learning from that and then trying something and adapting. Go back to adaptability, I think, Sam. So that that concept of almost if you're the senior person, create some safe space so people can try and learn by doing. But actually also being open to to having a go at something yourself if, if you're if you're the person coming into the firm. And um, Mira, were you going to add something to that? Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's about um, you, you need to be in the right environment to allow this kind of creative thinking and a little bit kind of out of the box and whatever. And I think, you know, we in particular are quite fond of um, looking at software and looking at technology, in particular AI tech, for example, or software around supporting our litigation function to be more efficient. It's around the efficiencies to support the mental well-being, but it's also around the the software and technology and knowing what's out there and seeing whether or not there's anything innovative that you can bring to the table and um, especially in an in-house function you know if you're the one if you're the kind of junior lawyer that pipes up and, and says well hang on a minute have you thought about this you're already kind of at the seat you know getting a seat at the table and ultimately it's going to create a more efficient legal function it'll support your your well-being but it also starts to add value in the business as well and it might there might be a cost saving generated or maybe something else that we could do around that and i think it's um it, it, either they're all kind of interlinked and tied into each other i mean where we are particularly looking at litigation software and we are looking at um ai technology and there are a lot of providers out there but again all of this stuff is for the benefit of um the business and it means that as a, as a leader as a manager you can't you can't automatically say i want 30 extra lawyer signs you need to kind of get your house in order first and it's going to be you know those the, the junior lawyers that come in that i hire or the trainees you know it, it's the ones you know if we think about new skills you know the ones who are extremely proficient in excel spreadsheets or pivot tables or gantt charts or whatever you're all hanging a minute that's great. Can, can you come over here and can we have a conversation? It's it's the skills which differentiate them as well now. OK, that's really interesting. 
Is that and, um, if I could just chip in there, it was just a very basic point, but um, it's quite hard to be creative looking at a computer 10, 12 hours a day. Sure. Um, so do give us, do reflect uh, individually. We should all reflect on a changed environment, even if one moves on chair, sort of turns around in the room. I appreciate some people don't have space, don't have much alternative. But to the extent one can sort of walk around and start to think creativity in a different way, I think it's a, a really important perspective. Um, and just think about the way one one is doing things in terms of creating what the, the impression of oneself, so one's own personal brand and personal thoughts. Remember, um, as, as, as younger practitioners, as, as younger graduates, people going in to uh, universities may well have very, very more sophisticated um, uh, uh, technical skills, uh, which gives them uh, a huge advantage in terms of more senior people sometimes. Mm -hmm. So just think a little bit, not only creative in the context of the practice of law, but also in terms of oneself and how one can differentiate. So think about creative networking, think about creative use of knowledge, not just about if one's got a really complicated legal problem, um, it might be really quite hard to be creative. <laughs> I mean, there may not be a magical solution. There's not always a silver bullet or whatever the phrase is. So think about creativity on a broad level and include in that environment because the mind moves, certainly in my case, the mind benefits from changed locations. Well, that's very true, isn't it, Roger? I mean, you know, it's not simply about the legal bit in front of you, but it's about can you do this in a different way, which is easier or faster or offers more value to, to your clients? Or can you, uh, you know, build, like find another way to build up networks faster? Or, and this point about using technology, and it's interesting because it hasn't necessarily come up in today's conversation, but I think it's worth us just touching on. Um, obviously, you know, well, there's an awful lot of talk about how important technology is in, in the law firm of the future. But just very quickly for our audience, I'm really conscious of the time. What, when legal employers talk about being data aware and data literacy, what does that actually mean for, you know, people who are seeking entry into the profession? Catherine, do you want to have a, do you want to answer that? Yes, um, I mean, a lot of you will have heard about the rise of, of legal tech, um, perhaps uh, primarily in the context of, of, of it taking over your jobs in the first instance, which uh, I think um, I think uh, the tech is still going to need someone to feed information into it and to operate it. So uh, if you really understand how it works and more importantly, how you can deploy it in the service of your clients, um, that gives you a real edge. Um, one of the things that people in my firm hear me say all the time is this is not just about tech for tech's sake. Yes, we know you love the gadgets. Yes, we know some of you are really good at using them, but think about how does it move the ball forward? How does it advance the clients matter or help them achieve their, uh, their, their business objectives? So I would always say, what is it in service of and primarily delivering um, a result to your client? The other thing I would say is um, the data that goes into the technology is huge. You'll have all heard about big data data analytics being the skill of the future. And that's something that in my experience has I've found a bit lacking in um, in our profession. And for me, that's something that would really make a difference um, to um, all of the things we've talked about, particularly this issue of demonstrating commerciality. Because if you put yourselves in the shoes of your clients, whether um, it's an individual client or a company that's working with a barrister or a major corporate that's working with a firm like mine, when you spend any any amount of time with them, you realize that their decisions are totally driven by data. They're driven by, um, for example, their product sales, their headcount, their stock price. And um, if you are not on top of that, and if you can't look at that and assess patterns and trends and understand how that feeds into the legal work you're doing, that really um, sets you back. And I think on the contrary, if you are really on top of that, you do develop that skill from an early stage in your career, that will really set you apart from uh, from your competitors. You often hear lawyers wail, I'm not a numbers person, you know, talk, talk to the accountants. But I think we as legal advisors can really cross that um, or bridge that gap um, between the two, interpret what the accountants are reporting on, but also um, share with the rest of the team what it is the client wants to achieve um, and, uh, and, and, take the, uh, and take the matter forward from there. 
So for me, that would be something that would mark out someone as being different and having real value to add to a matter I'm working on if I'm a, a senior lawyer in a firm or to uh, to my client if I'm the, the GC. Mira can definitely talk to that um, a, a lot more than I can, but that would be for me um, something uh, that really helps you stand out. Um, yeah. Sam, just, just one thought, building on Catherine, what you say, I'll let Mira speak there as well. It just struck me from all things you said, the future perhaps is quite cross-disciplinary, mm. it seems yeah, as yes. well. So it just made me think about some of the things we've said about networks as well, mm. and just made me think, so so here's a little job for you. I suppose if you're listening to this and you're, say you're in a law, law department or whatever, how many computer scientists do you know in, in your university or how many people in a different faculty do you know? Go and have a chat with them. Find out what's going on in their world. I mean, it, you know, that might, that, might, that might be an interesting thing. It made me think, Catherine. Mm. Yeah. I think that's great advice, Nigel, because it, it just, one, it improves your knowledge. It also then means that when you get into practice, you can bridge that gap and have better conversations uh, with different disciplines. Um, and I'm, we're in the dying moments, but there's one really great question that's come in, which I want to make sure we've answered. I think it's really critical. It picks up on this point of networking. Um, so Will asks, looking at the importance of creativity and networking, how would you advise us to go about networking in COVID times? Really good question. So super quick round from each of the members of the panel. Could you give our audience one example of what good networking looks like and an example of that that you've come across in the last three months? So I would say, um, good networking you know you're all going to be tech savvy use that social media wisely curate your linkedin profile keep it professional utilize the algorithm algorithms in that piece of software to be the best version of yourself in that professional sphere but don't just focus on linkedin focus on twitter as well um, twitter is not primarily a business social network but you'll be able to follow relevant <coughs> organization and build your network what i would say is you know when i hired when i hire people i put their name in google and all sorts of stuff pops up so just be a little bit mindful in terms of what your facebook account looks like or keep it separate we all have lives that's absolutely fine there's nothing wrong with that but just just be a little bit kind of you know if you if you, if you want to be in the law and you want to get your face out there, just curate your, your LinkedIn profile to be a bit, bit more kind of professional, but, but use it. I mean, I was a LinkedIn savvy for years, and then the last three or four years I've been using it, and you know, it, it's brought me to, to all of you today. So I'm, I'm quite pleased. Um, okay, just just one from me then. I think that's great advice. Absolutely, I was going. LinkedIn was going through my mind, um, me as well. So, at the risk of making myself very unpopular with the other panelists, I was going to say to everyone out there, follow up. You know, because many of us are, you know, attending as we've all said these virtual coffees, virtual vacation schemes. You know, if you, if there's a speaker, you know, or, or perhaps someone at a firm where you're thinking of applying that you hear them speak at a campus event or you hear an employer you know you hear, you've heard Mira from you know from the sector you're in Mira you hear someone from shipping you hear someone from whatever sector you're interested in bounce them an email as you say via LinkedIn perhaps you know there are ways to find find folk and um, and get in touch so as, as I say you know follow up follow up you know with one or two people and be quite um, be quite uh, focused about it perhaps narrow it down but follow up with one or two people um, and I would say pay it forward. Um, start from a perspective of helping people. Um, I, I cannot, I can, I cannot tell you how many times um, so I have given a useful piece of information or connected someone, and then maybe months or even years later, it comes round to me again, um, and and that person is is in a position to help me or connect me with someone. And you can do that virtually just as well um, as you can physically. If anything, if you're the kind of person who hates um, standing in a room full of strangers holding a glass of wine or, or orange juice, um, now is the perfect opportunity to network in a different way. And um, you can do it through all the platforms as, as Mira and Nigel have said. Um, also just joining interest groups if you're interested in a particular industry or through your university or college, they have a number of societies and you never know um, when you're going to meet that person who will suddenly unlock something for you. So I would always, where you can give generously of your time, maybe join things that you wouldn't necessarily have first thought of and um, and it will pay back um, in the uh, in the longer run. I, I, it's easy for me to say it's always hard this one. It's like the, the, the sports uh, commentators when it's the last one speaking runs out of ideas. But 
I've, I've got to go. <laughs> I agree with all of the above, but actually one thought I had was um, when you do follow up, uh, follow up, try and make a value added comment. Again, from the clients repeatedly, where's the value, where's the value, where's the value? I do appreciate following up is in itself inherently valuable in the building of networks and groups within networks. But if you can say, I, I watched the show, uh, I, I watched the podcast, I watched the panel, and I was particularly interested in what you said about X, because I've always wondered whether, in fact, the following would occur. Uh, I read the article and I particularly like the argument you ran about Z because I've got a personal experience in that area. So differentiate again, differentiate oneself. But I think in the longer term, um, peer groups, because think about developing the connections continually at your level, because your level will be running the show and the shows in 10, 20, 30 years time. And at the pace of change at the moment, it might even be in three years or four years or five years, but peer groups are really important, not only because they're potential sources of business, one never knows where people are going to go, uh, but for the reason that, that Catherine gave, which, which is the supportive network, which I would say is as important today as it's ever been. Uh, so think about that, not only in the context of um, client organisations, people at your level in client organisations or in interest areas, but also in your your firm, in your class, in your group, whichever group it is. And the group may be, how are we going to get uh, a graduate scheme? How are we going to get a training contract? That might be the group. We'll share information and data because it's supportive uh, and ultimately it will be productive. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And um, I think we're going to have to draw this to a close, which is really sad because like, we really could keep going and there are questions that we didn't get to, but we've run out of time. So um, I'm really sorry if we didn't get to your question. And but I just want to end now by saying a really big thank you to all our panelists. Thank you as well to everyone for joining us today. Your questions have made this a terrific discussion and I hope that you all got a lot from listening to the responses from the panel. Thanks as well to the King's team who are instrumental in behind the scenes in getting this session together so quickly. So Chris Howard, the Director of Professional Legal Education here at King's, Madeline, our events leader, Christine and the PLA and Brian, um, who's our technical guru behind the scenes. Um, just to end with saying we've made progress already in organising our next series of talks and we're already very impossibly, some might say, far too excited about the topics and speakers to come. So please do watch this space for that. But in the meantime, if everyone, wherever you are, could please give a big virtual round of applause to Nigel, Roger, Mira and Catherine. Absolutely fantastic panel, great discussion, loads of really useful hints and tips there for you all to take forward. Um, and as I mentioned at the start, the recording of this session and all our talks can be found on the PLI website, which you can see to the top left hand side of your screen. So do make sure you take a look there and details of the next series of talks will also get there, get there in due course. So thank you very much everyone again for attending and to our panel for participating and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you everybody. Thank you. So